Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar covering the LATAM COVID consumer. My name is Ari Delgado. I am the Digital Marketing Director for America's Market Intelligence, and I'm going to be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. So before we get started, I just want to give you a quick update here of how things are going to be today. We'll start off our presentation, and it'll take about 40, 45 minutes or so, and then at that point, we'll be able to answer questions. You can ask questions at any point in time during the webinar, however, and actually we encourage you to do so as the questions come to you, by all means, fire away. The way to do that is if you look at your screen, you should see a series of icons on the, pan, uh, the participation panel at the top. One of them is gonna say Q&A. So if you click on that, it brings up a window and you can write your uh, question in that window, hit enter and we'll receive it. And then we'll address as many as we can uh, towards the end of the webinar. So uh, one of the main questions we always get, uh, just to get this one out of the way, uh, is, uh, are the materials going to be available after the webinar? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Within 24 to 48 hours, we usually send a copy of the video and the presentation itself to everyone who has signed up for the webinar. So you should receive those materials. All right, well, let's move on to the next portion of our uh, webinar here with our legal notice. I'm not going to read this. This basically just talks about how our panelists are expressing uh, their personal views, but not necessarily the views of the companies that they represent, and also how we went about verifying the information that's being presented today. You can read that all at your leisure. Uh, I don't want to drag things, but that's just an important legal disclaimer that we want to get out of the way, so you can take a look at that later on if you like. Let's move on now to our introductions and presenting our panelists to you today. So um, I'm, of course, the moderator there on the far left. Also, to lead us off, we're going to have John Price, our managing director for AMI. And then from Echo Market Research, who are our partners today on this particular study, we're going to have John Holcomb, who is the senior VP. And we're going to have Anna Venegas, who is the full service research director. So they're both going to be participating in today's webinar. And those are our speakers. So let's get started. And I'm going to turn the floor over to John Price to sort of lead us off. John. Abel, thanks so much uh, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you again. Uh, some of you may recall, we, uh, we teamed up with Echo Market Research uh, almost a year ago in June of 2020 when um, Latin Americans were in the early stages of lockdowns. And we polled them and we've repeated this exercise again with John Holcomb and now with Ana Venegas uh, joining us today to present that data. And I'm going to... Um, also present some findings that we've had put together earlier this year around our outlook for Latin America. So between sort of a, um, <clears throat> our landscape approach to the region and uh, ECHO's very specific um, survey data, we're hoping to build a, a, a picture, an understanding of the consumers today. So very pleased to be teaming up with ECHO Market Research again. A little bit about AMI. We are a um, Latin America and Caribbean market focused uh, market intelligence firm. And um, we operate in several segments, including the consumer space, but also logistics, payments, energy, mining, industrial, and healthcare. And we've been doing this for almost 30 years now, um, um, well over 3,000 engagements over that period of time. And how do we define market intelligence? We look at really, uh, we look at the world through our clients' eyes and we help our clients make tough decisions. Um, decisions like uh, what their market entry strategy should look like. Should they buy or build a business? Um, should they, uh, what products should they bring to market? How should they adapt their products to further penetrate a market? How do they build brand awareness? Um, what are the reputational risks associated with a particular partner, be it a distribution partner or a joint venture partner? And should they go ahead and pursue that relationship with that company? Uh, we do this by looking out outside of their firm at three areas, the customer, how might customers, actual and potential customers react to that decision? That's market research. The competitor, how will the competitors react to that decision? That's competitive intelligence and context, which is a combination of the economics and politics and, of course, the regulatory environment in which your business operates. And we take into account those three areas and, and come up with our um, series of decision uh, recommendations for you. Over to you, John Holcomb. 
Hey, John, thanks so much for having us back this year. It's a pleasure to be working again with AMI on this really interesting study that we, we uh, put together, as John said, about one year ago and now have followed up with a second wave, uh, essentially the exact same research. So we're going to be looking at some really interesting trends today. A little bit about ECHO. Um, ECHO Market Research uh, is a international marketing research company. We were in 80 different countries uh, doing studies in 2020, of course, online. Uh, we are remote, uh, we are online, and we are incredibly agile. Uh, and we offer fully flexible, custom, full service research uh, throughout Latin America, North America, Europe, and APAC regions. Next slide. What we're really good at at ECHO is, is what we call active recruiting. Um, we actively work to find people to participate in our research, whether it's qualitative research or quantitative research through online and social outreach. So we're trying to get to people where they live and breathe rather than from panels uh, that tend to yield professional respondents. So that's our key. It's relying on participants coming to us through our passive recruitment and finding them and asking them to participate in the research. I think, John, we're back to you. Great, thank you. Okay, before we get into the survey results, I wanted to walk you through an analysis that we uh, did a couple months ago. Um, and it's an analysis that we've done each year for the last five years. Uh, we call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. And um, both through our industry practices, we analyze Latin America in this, in this way. Um, and I typically take on the analysis of comparing countries. Um, we broadened the analysis this year because in broad stroke, uh, last year, 2020, was a bad year for everybody. And this year, uh, every economy is growing. But there are big differences this time as the, as the region comes back from the worst of the economic impact of COVID. And of course, many countries are still struggling through the healthcare crisis of COVID. <clears throat> but um, we wanted to, I wanted to walk you through this because this will provide some context and a little bit of meaning and a little bit of understanding to um, the trends that the consumer survey also reveal. So let's move on. Before we begin, I'd like to um, start by polling everybody. Um, there, you, you should see a poll come up and you can answer the question, which country will be in the best economic condition at the end of this year? Um, so please give us your responses to that. We'll, we'll give uh, everyone 20 seconds or so to respond. Um, interesting results. Uh, very few favoring Brazil vast majority favoring Chile or Mexico. Um, towards the end of my small presentation on the good, bad, and ugly, you'll see what our determination is of, uh, of, the, of these countries. So we'll, uh, we're almost, uh, I think, exhausting the motivation of people to respond to this. So let's go ahead and publish the results. Um, I'm going to read them out because when we distribute the video, uh, you won't see it. Uh, those who, who watch the recording of this won't see it. So I'm going to say Brazil was 6% of the responses. Chile was 52%. Peru was 6%. Ecuador, 1%. Mexico, 29%. Colombia, 5%. Argentina, nil. So um, thank you for that. Uh, that is uh, very... Um, as you'll see on, on the last side that I present, that's not far off from our prediction as well. And Chile definitely stands out above the rest. And we'll get into why is that. So let's, um, let's go ahead and, and show the next slide. Now, of course, Latin America uh, is, in fact, by many measures, the most globalized region in the world. By that, I mean it is a region that is most uh, influenced by externalities both good and negative. The reason for this is fairly straightforward. As Latin Americans, we don't have much faith in our, <clears throat> in our governance, uh, the governance of our countries, and we don't have much faith in the protection of our assets. 
So about $6 trillion of Latin American savings are kept outside of the region. In property, in places like Miami, in bank accounts around the world, um, in stocks and bonds, et cetera. And as a result, Latin America must borrow money from abroad and therefore is very vulnerable to any fluctuations in monetary policies around the world. Um, as well, since it exports its commodities very effectively, it relies upon the demands for those commodities elsewhere outside of the region. So these are some of the reasons that you have to look at outside the region when understanding what's going to happen inside the region economically. On the good side, we have strong growth out of China and the US. These are the two biggest markets in the world. They're also the two biggest buyers of Latin American exports, particularly commodities. You have negative real interest rates. Not only the central banks of the United States and China and Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia have poured, uh, have amplified the world's monetary supply of money by around 12%. Um, which has just poured cash, uh, trillions of dollars of cash going into all, you know, pumping up assets around the world. But what's really interesting this time around, and this is the sixth economic crisis in Latin America that I've uh, lived and worked through, um, is that this time around, the, the very, the painstaking reforms of um, governments, many governments in Latin America over the last 25 years, and the autonomy of central banks have allowed central banks to build up enough reserves, have allowed these countries to build up enough reserves, that even though there was capital flight at the beginning of COVID, most of the, at least the leading central banks in Latin America, were able to maintain or drop interest rates during COVID. That is the first time this has ever happened in an economic crisis in Latin America. Typically, Central banks have to raise interest rates to stop money from leaving the country. And of course, that just kills uh, investment um, appetites inside Latin America. So this was actually, this feature alone saved hundreds of large companies in Latin America from going bankrupt. And then the other really interesting feature is that although remittance flows did drop as particularly Latin American uh, migrants in the United States were out of work, construction jobs, service sector especially, early on in COVID. By the end of 2020, remittances had, had, had grown again and were back. And actually, as the whole year of 2020 grew slightly over 2019. And this is, again, in large part because many states in the U.S. opened up their service economy, particularly construction has been booming in the United States and construction pays well and tends to have a high participation of Mexican and Central American uh, workers. And even service sectors in a lot of U.S. states opened up quickly. Now, that was criticized by some, but it was an absolute lifeline for working migrants in these sectors uh, to keep any money home. On the ugly side, um, vaccine policies, you've had all kinds of nepotism, even corruption uh, accusations in Latin America where they, uh, instead of buying, um, buying the best vaccines, they bought vaccines from more dubious uh, sources um, under dubious contractual agreements. You have, con you have uh, hoarding by, of vaccines by different rich countries around the world. And as a result, the vaccine programs in Latin America are way behind. And that's a problem because at the end of the day, as we've learned, different waves and different variants can cause a return to high infection rates and death rates in places like Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil today. Um, and also, people aren't going to be confident about consuming until they know it's safe to go out. And probably the greatest long-standing damage of COVID, more than the healthcare crisis, is the sheer economic cost of lockdowns. 60% of Latin Americans work informally, and those people, uh, their incomes didn't drop a little bit. They dropped by a huge margin. Um, and some of them went from you know, full income to zero income. Of those 60%, very few can work from home. So you have huge swaths of the population whose livelihood was taken away at the stroke of a pen. Um, and this is causing all kinds of rancor because it was a group of government officials who continue to get paid full pay from home during lockdowns, determining the rules, often on relatively arbitrary um, bases, that, that cut off the livelihood of millions of Latin Americans. And as a result, 
about 30 million were driven from working class into poverty, below the poverty line. Some of those were brought back by counterspending uh, programs in places like Chile, Brazil, and Peru. But in many countries that couldn't afford it, like Colombia, or chose not to afford it, like Mexico, um, those people remain in poverty. And we are seeing the political backlash of this in many countries. And we will continue to see that political backlash over the next year um, as those people try to get their lives back together. Um, and the disparity of wealth, which was already the worst in the world, has gotten worse. So on that cheerful note, let's move on to the next. Um, in the United States, the Wall Street Journal published an article that said this is a K recovery which talked about how some segments of the economy were doing really well and some continue to do poorly. And often it was tied to what industry you work in and you get paid in. So if you are in the entertainment industry or tourism industry or the restaurant industry, you're on that bottom arm of the K. But if you were in the e-commerce industry, if you were um, in certain finance fields, you did very well. And the same goes for Latin America. You've had an incredible um, growth in digital commerce as people were forced to buy online. And much of our survey will delve into this very issue. You've had a rebounding mining industry, first in uh, precious metals, because the central bank loose monetary policy has stoked inflation and driven a lot of people into gold and silver and other precious metals. But you also see a rebound in industrial growth, in a rebound in infrastructure growth, and the electric vehicle revolution that is driving demand for things like copper that have driven those prices to record levels. So you've had a rebounding strong mining sector. And then exports. Latin America has always worked its way out of recession through exports and does very well in price elastic um, products. So natural resources, commodities, manufacturing, which tends to be assembly manufacturing and is all about efficient and cheap labor, as well as outsourced services. These are where Latin America excels as an exporter, and these tend to do very well after an economic crisis when currencies have been hit vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. On the less encouraging side, you have a public sector. If you sell, if, you, if your products were sold traditionally in the public sector, Public sectors across Latin America are in a really tight bind because their largest uh, EVA tax base, the service sector, has declined. Um, income taxes are down. And even uh, in some countries, particularly energy producers, their taxes were down over the last 12 months. So you have these governments trying to get back to fiscal balance by raising taxes. But of course, that um, is what sparked the protests in Colombia and will spark other protests as governments try to satisfy international creditors on the one hand, but satisfy a populace that still continues to need fiscal support. Um, brick and mortar retail um, will disappear in sub segments. In some of these countries, they lost a million retailers. Um, and some of them will never come back because they're so niche that now consumers have realized it's much easier to buy online. The same thing happened in the United States, the same thing happened in China over the last 10 years. Healthcare, <clears throat> you'd think that a health crisis would be good for healthcare. Well, actually it hasn't been. Um, unless you're in the business of vaccines, um, hospitals which get their money from programmable surgeries number two and ER activity number, uh, sorry, programmable surgeries number one and ER activity number two, both are down. And education. Latin America still has a lot of its schools closed um, and was not in a good position to pivot to online education in most cases, some private schools, but even the private schools, I'm told, not so much. And Lat, you know, education in Latin America is one of the great leveling fields um, between the, you know, the lower and middle and upper classes. And without it, um, that only aggravates this disparity of wealth. So those are some of the differences. And those of you who sell into these different industries need to be cognizant of uh, not, bro not brushing a broad stroke across these markets, but looking specifically at industries and the prospects of specific industries. Let's look at the countries of Latin America on the next slide. 
So we looked at six different metrics uh, we felt were determinant of the ability of a country's uh, prospects to rebound. And <clears throat> uh, when will they reach herd immunization? Uh, can they continue and will they continue to have loose central bank um, policies? Can they continue to run fiscal deficits or do they really have to tighten their belts? Um, do they have the right product mix to um, grow their exports quickly? Are investors feeling good about these countries as a place to invest? And did their currencies hold up throughout the crisis and therefore protect per capita income in dollars? Most of us in Latin America consume in dollarized products in one form or the other. So per capita income in dollars is a very important metric. When you look at those and you stack them up, Chile is by far ahead. It's ahead in its vaccine drive. It has the right export mix. It has good fiscal health. It can continue to run deficits. Um, in spite of concern about what will happen with the Constitutional Assembly and the end of your elections, there's still long-term in including um, um, institutional investor confidence in Chile. Um, looking at a couple of other countries, um, Mexico. Mexico is a country that has opened up quite a bit. Its service sector is open. Um, most of the, many of the municipalities went from red to yellow and many from yellow to green light over the last week. Um, Good fiscal health, uh, AMLO uh, criticized for many things has been very fiscally conservative, but the sentiment around AMLO and his political interference in certain industries has hurt investor sentiment. So that's why it's lower down than say Peru or Chile. Colombia, of course, um, has uh, what's going on right now has many people concerned, most of all Colombians, um, but also has investors concerned. Is this a place where there's going to be a political pivot to something more populist? Is it a country where the consumer segment will continue to spend? Um, and so, and it's a country with relatively high debt. So the government's ability to maintain on that one hand, good ratings with the ratings industry, but on the other hand, deal with um, so many of its people falling into poverty is a real dilemma. And so that's why, you know, Colombia is further down on the list. So I won't touch on the other countries. Uh, happy to discuss those one-on-one -on -one with you, but this is sort of how we see the region country by country. And with that, I'll pass it back to John Holcomb to walk us through the survey results. Thanks, John, for that summary. I always learn something listening to you talk about the region, but I wanted to vote. I wasn't able to vote. So I'm gonna talk to Bell about that. Just to give you a quick, uh, overview of our survey methodology as we get into discussing the results. Um, once again, this year, this was uh, a mobile forward, mobile first design that was rapid. It was online. Uh, it was mobile and it was brief. Um, the average survey was under 12 minutes in, in total length. And we surveyed that's actually 3,026. That's a combination of the two. So in 2020, we did about 2,000 completes between May 28th and June 6th of 2020. And in 2021, we surveyed another wave of about 1,000 consumers, online consumers in Latin America, 18 years up, 18 years old and up. Uh, and that was done between March 19th and April 2nd. So next slide, please. Our survey last year revealed five different consumer segments based upon their responses to their online behavior. And just to get you grounded in these five segments, I want to let you know who comprises each one of them and, and the names and, and why we named them what we did. Newbies, I think, is a pretty obvious one. This is a group of people who made their first online purchase during the pandemic, so last year. And when we survey people again this year, we're talking about their behavior over the past three months. So in 2020, it was pre-pandemic, pre-quarantine. And then this year is the past three months. So those are the two time frames we're looking at. Retreaters are folks who suffered a lot of job losses and economic hardship in their households and their online share of regular purchase goes down during the pandemic. 
while maintainers are obviously people who are maintaining their online share of regular purchases during the pandemic and over the past three months. Adapters, about just a technical question. I can't get the Q&A out of my screen. Hang on a second. Sorry about this. So I can't see the slide. Oh, interesting. Anyways. Adapters are people whose online share of regular purchases grew somewhat during the pandemic. And we'll see how that behaved and panned out over the last three months. While disruptors are the folks whose online share of regular purchases increased quite a bit during the pandemic and continues to grow, as you'll see in the, in, in the past three months. Next slide, Abel. Thank you. Um, okay, um, online purchases are still gaining relevance in the region. Maintainers are becoming adapters and some adapters are becoming disruptors. This shows that people are still increasing their online shopping. Next. Okay. Um, this slide shows the segments profile. Newbies, people who are doing their first online purchase are mainly single females, older than 35 years old, and this segment has the lowest education level. So they have found ways to do online purchases using different apps to do online payments or getting a new credit card to do online shopping. On the contrary, disruptors, the segment that has increased their online purchases are people with high education level among 25 and 45 years old and adapters, the biggest segment, are people with higher education level among 25 to 45 years old. Retreaters, the segment that has decreased their online purchases, are mainly people older than 20, 45 years old. Thank you, Anna. Sorry I didn't get the chance to introduce you there. That's my, my no apologies problem. for that. <laughs> Appreciate it. That I see some of the questions coming in about when is Latin America, when are these countries going to recover their levels of pre-pandemic economic growth? And when we look at the households, there's a lot of folks still suffering economically in the region. Uh, we see just slight upticks in some metrics over the past three months that are improving. By segment, for example, retreaters Fewer have lost their job temporarily over the past three months than in, in March of 2020, a year ago. Among maintainers, a slight downtick in the number of households that have experienced reduced household income. Among disruptors, the wealthiest and most educated segment in our survey, they're continuing to work at home. They're suffering fewer job losses and fewer and less reduced income. And as you look, some of the new questions we asked um, was had their household income returned to pre-pandemic levels. And among disruptors, 26% of the households said yes, 18% of the adapters. But then when you look at retreaters and newbies, the numbers are much lower, just 6% and 15% in those two segments. Go ahead. And when we combine that, that economic contraction within a household with the negative lifestyle indicators that we tracked last year, um, we're going to talk a little bit later on about how personal and, and family mental health have become an important part of, of Latin Americans' lives recently. Um, we see some improvements in exercise, and we see some metrics going in the wrong direction. There's still large portions of the people within these segments who are sleeping worse, who are eating worse, still gaining weight and not exercising more. The next slide. When we look at their attitude, you know, clearly there was an uptick in irritation over the pandemic and the restrictions in Brazil, and we're seeing of course, the, the manifestation of that now in Colombia. 
Um, but our segmentation on attitudes remained fairly stable over the, over the two waves of this study. About 36, 37% would describe themselves as philosophical, more cool-headed with a wait-and-see attitude uh, about the pandemic, while another third or so, 31 and 32%, were feeling stronger or redefined. They had found or become inspired to assess their track in life and start some new things and make some changes for the future. About 20% are the folks who find a silver lining. Perhaps they find a silver lining in just about anything. Um, but they were the people who are valuing their friends and family more and want to live life to the fullest and to the max. And after experiencing the isolation and the restrictions during the pandemic, um, you know, each experience is, is much more valuable to them now. And finally, a small portion of the population, 9 and 12 percent, who are feeling still irritated and scared. And that uptick I talked about was mostly driven by Brazil and our survey results. I think if we did it now, Colombia would also show a similar um, trend as well. And these are people who are worried about their health. Um, they're frustrated about their losses and in income and the household situation. And they're frustrated with the lockdowns. When we then look at those segments, the attitudinal segments by our online purchasing segments, we can see how they kind of play out. Um, disruptors, adapters, maintainers and retreaters are much more philosophical about the situation than the newbies. Newbies are viewing themselves as stronger and more redefined uh, as well as the retreaters a little bit more in that segment as well. But what's important here is to you know, think about how you might be connecting and talking to your customers in the region uh, and taking into account how their outlook has really been shaped and impacted by COVID. And we'll take the next slide. And I'm gonna turn it over to Anna, thank you. Yes, okay. Uh, as we have seen, while shopping online is still very much top of mind, concern over mental health is, ro is growing rapidly. Due to restrictions that for families and friends, and friends to stay apart, isolation is becoming one of the main drivers for anxiety and depression. Latin Americans' young adults are suffering more than other cohorts, unemployment, and unable to pay tuition. Their dreams and futures have been placed on hold. Next. Thank you, Anna. You know, we mentioned that earlier in the, you know, education, John Price brought that up and it's really the, the younger students in Latin America who are suffering the brunt of this, unable to work, unable to pay tuitions, out of school, uh, not being able to attend class. And so they're, they're definitely disproportionately suffering during this uh, pandemic. When we start to look at online purchase in the region, um, these next slides, I just wanna quickly explain to you what you're looking at here. The blue uh, area behind the three, the red and the light gray transparent one uh, is their numbers before the quarantine. What share of their regular purchases, excluding Uber or online streaming services like Netflix uh, were being made online? before the quarantine. The red area there is what they were predicting one year ago after the quarantine. And then the light gray transparent numbers are what they said they did in the past three months. Um, and you'll notice on, on most of these slides as we look at some of the segments here that people's predictions a year ago as to what they would be spending online were far exceeded by their, their actual behavior especially over the past three months. And so here, when we look at all the population in Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico combined, um, we see that almost 50% of the online population was making greater than half of their regular purchases online versus just 18% before the quarantine. So that's a massive jump. There's tons of numbers out there as far as you know how much the online e-commerce category grew in Latin America. 
I've seen numbers as high as a 40 percent growth uh, in 2020 over 2019, and uh, we see certainly see that playing out in, in our data as well. Next slide, about. So who's pushing this growth? What really, the way we can think about it is that adapters who started making some more online purchases uh, have become disruptors and some maintainers have made more and become adapters. And then there's a new set of newbies that has also come in over the past three months. Um, but really adapters and disruptors keep on spending and uh, you know greatly exceeded their predicted online spend uh, of, of over a year ago. So we've got now 56% of adapters and 86% of disruptors making more than half of their regular purchases online in the past three months. Next slide. And when we take a look at the newbies, while overall, absolutely, the number of newbies that entered the market in the past three months is, is smaller than it was uh, one year ago, um, their online share of regular purchase continues to grow, uh, not at rates as high as the other segments, but certainly um, this newly digitized generation uh, of online shoppers is now, you know, firmly in there spending in the past three months, 23% spent about six to 10% uh, of their online purchases, their regular purchases were made online. And 45% um, have made greater than 10% of their regular purchases online in the last three months. And when you look at what they're doing for the first time, um, new streaming services pop uh, over last year, 22% versus 10% saying they, they purchased an online streaming service for the first time in the past three months. I know I saw Spotify, I think grew 36% of the region in 2020 and and i saw a crazy number from netflix something about projecting 48 million subscribers by the end of 2025 so certainly online entertainment is a very very hot segment in the market right now and we'll see how that kind of dovetails into uh, consumer behavior and what they're doing uh, with at home and and vis-a-vis -vis exercise and cooking and, and going out to eat or ordering food in and things like that Next slide, please. And this trend looks to be very stable. Um, their online purchase intent for the next three months uh, is very similar to what they said they've been doing in the past three months. So we would expect to see this type of growth to continue. Next slide, please. When we look at their overall shopping behavior, I mean, what, what clearly sticks out here is the increase in the use of credit cards in the next three months predicted, uh, the decrease in shopping and traditional retail venues like malls, commercial centers, uh, big box stores, large format stores, um, and their intent to continue to purchase things online digital, digitally in general. Um, and when you see these flags on the other side of these bars, it, it just refers to which country is driving more of that trend than the others. So in this case, in Brazil, we saw um, a large percentage of people saying they're not using cash, they're using more credit cards, they're not shopping in certain venues and they're shopping online. Next slide. And as I mentioned, when we look at the health and lifestyle behavior, it, it, you know, exercise in general is predicted to be up, exercising at home, uh, house cleaning, which is a good thing. I, I wanted to note that only 4% of people in Latin America thought they'd be cleaning their house less over the next three months, but also more of the, the, those mental health types of activities. Yoga and meditation um, is up over last year quite a bit. Um, natural medicines and supplements, vitamins uh, is up. And you see the countries like Colombia and Mexico who are leading in house cleaning, Brazil and Mexico and yoga. Um, and interestingly, uh, or perhaps not interestingly, cons consuming alcohol is up over last year quite a bit. 
uh, and that's being led by Brazil. And there was a pretty good regional uptick in consuming medical cannabis products as well, um, again, led by Brazil. And when we look at the next slide, in the travel and transportation market, it doesn't look like there are going to be, uh, there's going to be a strong recovery in 2021 overall uh, in these countries. Um, in 2020, the declines in domestic tourism dropped, you know, 40%. I've seen even higher numbers depending on the country. Um, perhaps international tourism this year will provide some, um, some buoyancy to the market for this really hard hit sector in Latin America. As John alluded to earlier, there's still travel restrictions between states or departments in some of these countries. There's some very strict travel restrictions uh, for international travelers entering these countries. Um, but one of the things I wanna point out to you on this slide that, that's super interesting that has, has grown quite a bit over last year are the number of people who say that, for example, flying domestic, 49% say it's not applicable. Uh, that was about 30% last year. So people are taking these types of things uh, off the table, if you will. Um, public transportation is a big one that people are still avoiding. Uh, staying in hotels, you know, just traveling domestically around the country uh, for pleasure looks like it's going to remain down over the next year. So what's fun? What can we do for fun in Latin America? Well, we're going to order a food for home delivery and we're going to uh, clean our house and do yoga while, while we're eating the food that we've had delivered to the house. It's really the only bright spot here uh, that we see, obviously eating in restaurants, going out to the movies, um, attending events, whether they're indoors or outdoors, uh, over the next three months doesn't look to be a very vibrant sector in, in Latin America. And to look at some product purchase uh, information. Yes. Okay. Uh, what are they planning to buy? Uh, the pandemic continues to reshape the priority of purchase. In 2021 survey, in our last survey, more consumers are planning to buy a small kitchen appliance and sneakers for exercise. This shows that, that people is still, are still looking for options to be at activities at home. So people are planning to stay at home. Next. Okay, so it's... Uh calls upon me to try to uh, wrap this together and see what this means for us. I mean, as you can see, and one of the comments that was made that I think was very important is that some of this, <clears throat> uh, some of this data reflects uh, a strong second wave or third wave uh, in some markets that we're experiencing in Latin America today. So, um, but it's not across, it's not universally across these three countries. It's not felt universally across these three countries. So, it does explain some of the uptick um, you know, in the last three months. But what we've seen is that there has been the, the movement of people, the, the number of people who were conducting digital commerce was a number that was inching up. And over the last 12 months, it leapt because of COVID. And once you're online and once you feel comfortable buying online and you're comfortable with the customer service and the delivery and fulfillment of your products that you deliver, then in some categories, you never go back. Uh, it happened in China, it happened in the United States, it happened in Europe, and now it's happening in Latin America. Why? Because that product is, you know, to, to buy it uh, in, through conventional retail, you have to get in your car and cross town, or you had to drive to the next city uh, because it wasn't a grocery item or a, or a common clothing item. It was a very specific niche item. Those are the retailers that tend to, um, the traditional retailers that tend to suffer uh, once e-commerce becomes a broad category. We now have over 50% of people in these, of adults in these countries have tried e-commerce. We have crossed a threshold. And, and this is important because now the only thing slowing it down, now that people try it, what slows down e-commerce adoption at this point is, can they afford it? 
Uh, is fulfillment good? Do they get things like good satisfaction out of the returns when the product arrives broken or, or they're delivered something they don't like? These are the things that can, that can prove still obstacles to the growth of e-commerce, but we've gotten people online. COVID did that, just like SARS did in China in 2003. We know that COVID has concentrated wealth, or rather the lockdowns have concentrated wealth, because if you are working from home, you maintain your income. If you can't work from home, you did not. Um, we know that um, whether there are people are philosophical or a wait and see attitude, or they're reassessing their lives, or they're looking to a silver lining, trying to find um, you know, positivity in this tough environment, they have a lot of time and a lot of new tools to reassess their lives, to reprioritize their lives. Uh, Latin America has changed as a society over the last 12 months. And this is really important to pick up uh, as marketers. We have gone from a society that was aspirational. Yes, there was some super affluent who had sort of gone beyond aspirational consumption habits. But by and large, the middle class and upper middle classes of Latin America who are responsible for the bulk of consumer sales, branded consumer sales. These are people who are aspirational. Um, it was about fitting in. It was about having the right brands. It was about doing the right activities. That all came to a change under lockdown. We rediscovered or we refocused ourselves on our own health. Health became paramount. Physical health first and mental health later on. Reconnecting with our families and the simplicity of a good meal and spending time with them. Um, yes, our kids drove us crazy because we had, they couldn't go to school for a year, but we reconnected with our kids and we rediscovered, um, you know, the joys that that brought. And, and I think that um, another thing that we came to appreciate even more so, being under lockdown in cities was appreciation for nature, for, for clean air, um, and for the wealthy in Latin America, just like the wealthy in New York and the wealthy in San Francisco, they left the city and they moved to their second homes. I have, I have all kinds of anecdotes of people who moved out of Buenos Aires, moved out of Sao Paulo, moved out of Mexico City to their second homes. And so you have a, you have a consumer that is rethinking everything. Um, you have an e-commerce bump that has become an e-commerce permanent shift. And um, what does this mean to us as marketers? Well, if you are basing your brand positioning, your pricing, um, your distribution model on pre-COVID uh, norms, throw it out. Throw out that research and re-evaluate your business model because the channels have changed, the messaging that you need to make has changed, the price points you need to pursue have changed. And uh, as a result, you've got to redesign your business. Um, looking at customers and the way you segment has to go beyond demographics. It has to look at emotional metrics. And this is tricky because they can change quickly. Um, something dramatic happens, a, lock, a new lockdown, protests in the street, the, the narrative changes and with it, the emotions of consumers change. And so you have to be connected online, researching online, connecting to these people on a regular basis. Your channels have changed, your channel partners have to change, and your channel budgeting has to change, and your channel focus has to change. Product niche opportunities. You can bring a digital product or a digital service to market. There's great examples in Latin America of um, gymnasiums and sporting equipment and sporting services that went pivoted digital. Um, we've seen online food delivery, not just from traditional supermarkets, but from new business markets, business models like Mercado in Colombia that doesn't come from the grocery store. It comes from a wholesaler that takes product from a manufacturer. It skips a step. So we're seeing new business models being created. Um, if you're looking for best in practice, don't just look at Amazon and eBay, look at an Alibaba, look at these new startups. There was 500 venture capital um, funded startups in Latin America last year, a, a, a record, an historical record. And a lot of it, most all, all of it was digital business. And, and a lot of it was either pivoting or new business models or Latin Americanizing business models that had started elsewhere. Um, so look to those, look to the local companies for 
the right mix of how they approach customer service, how they approach fulfillment, um, the way that they use jobbers to do a lot of their fulfillment and bring their costs down, et cetera. And how you, how you spend your marketing budget has to reemphasize online, um, as well as the selling. How do you close the sale online? And the different techniques that are needed to do that. It's not just about raising awareness online. You have to be able to close the sale online. So these are some of the takeaways that we came up with um, for marketers. And at this point, I think um, we, want to, we want to open up to questions. We, we still have 10 minutes officially on our time, but we'll continue to answer questions beyond the time limit if you keep them coming. Um, but before that, we do want to ask one question, simple question of you. Um, we are offering a 30-minute consultation to talk to you and your business about how you're researching the market, um, how you're marketing today in Latin America, and what advice that we can provide to you as to uh, what adjustments you need to make. And so if you tell us um, you're interested in such a thing, uh, we'll reach out to you um, in the next few days and set up, an, uh, set up an appointment. If you're not ready to do it now, but you'd like to in future, um, we can reach out to you at a future date. So please go ahead and um, answer this last survey, and then we'll get into addressing your questions that you have posted in the Q&A. And those of you who have questions, haven't yet posted them, please do post them in the Q&A icon. It should be at the bottom of your screen on most computers. If you don't see the Q&A icon, there should be three dots. Click those and you'll get to the Q&A icon. If you're on a cell phone, it might be at the top of your screen. Okay, right, we'll close it there. And um, thank you for that. And let's move on to Q&A. Abel, you wanna moderate that? Absolutely. All right, let's take a look at some of our questions here. Uh, one that I found to be interesting that, that I think it's important to understand given the presentation of the study itself, what was the methodology criterion to split the surveyees into the five categories that were established? I'm assuming we've been the five. Um, uh, yeah, newbie. Online purchase categories, exactly. newbies, adapters. Yeah, just what their stated behavior was uh, in 2020. And, a, and of course, in the past three months, vis a vis online purchases. Have they been making less? Have they been making more? Have they been making a great deal more? Or had they made their first online purchase um, in the past three months? So the, that's, it was strictly defined by their described behavior. Okay. Um, but they weren't recruited along those lines. That was oh, no. uh, yeah, no, yeah. analysis right. after, right? Of course, yeah. Based upon their response to the question, but there was no recruiting of who had done what. Gotcha. All right. Well, there's another question here I thought was interesting, and, and John Holcomb um, referenced it a little bit. It had to do with basically sort of the recovery. And so um, what what uh, this uh, attendee was asking Luis is when will Mexico, uh, Brazil, and Argentina recover um, the levels of pre-pandemic years? So there's some hints in this data, but I think you have to sort of combine that also with sort of a macro analysis. So maybe this might be a better question for John Price to field and offer a rough idea of this, which is sort of putting on a swami hat, but it'll be better than nothing, I guess. So let's sure. give it a shot. Sure. No, as uh, John Holcomb pointed out, we, there was a question that um, asked about that, and there was some very strong differences between uh, disruptors and adapters who tend to have continued to work online and their incomes haven't been negatively impacted. They're also better educated um, and, you know, a higher percentage of them had recovered. When you look at the countries, um, again, it, it depends on what you define recovery. We define recovery as the size of the GDP in dollars gets back to where it was pre-pandemic. And if, uh, if you agree with that, um, it varies by country, but, uh, and, and we have done this analysis before, but it basically the, the soonest or the earliest country is sort of, I think is Chile and it's sort of Q1 2022. And the laggard, the most laggard of them all was Argentina and it's well into 2023 like late 2022. 
Okay, let's take a look at some of these other ones here. Some of them are, are a little tricky to answer, honestly, because, uh, for example, uh, Damas was asking uh, which product categories lost sales the most and which increased. And I think that's beyond the scope of this research. Um, my own clumsy attempt to answer that based on some of the e-commerce work that we've done separately, aside from what we presented here today, is the travel seemed to have taken the biggest hit. Like there was a surge in Latin America that we tracked for our e-commerce data pack, which is something that we put together here at AMI uh, in e-commerce in general, but it didn't grow as much as you would expect because travel dropped so much. And we've covered this in payments webinars in the past and have shared some of this data. So that's the one category I can think of. I'm not sure if the rest of the panel can think of other ones, but it's definitely, I think, would be by, beyond the, the scope for the most part of this research, no? Yes and no. It, it clearly travel took a big hit. And so hotels and restaurants, all of the things that were, were shut down uh, initially with the restrictions, the service sector, of course, took a big hit, but I think that the, you know, what, what this data points at through things like small kitchen appliances and exercising at home and sneakers, uh, you know, it, it sounds to me like people are still in a sense nesting, uh, still very much focused on what's in their home. Uh, Ann and I have been, been doing interviews around the region and we talked to a lot of people early on in the pandemic, for example, they bought an entire office set up for their home. So they had to get a desk, they had to get a chair, they had to get a monitor, they had to get all of these things that they, they didn't have when they weren't working inside the house. And so there's probably, you know, a, a pretty good trajectory that we could tease out of that. You know, John Price talked about the physical needs uh, being first. So food, what, you know, making sure your supplies are there uh, and then padding your home with the things that are going to make your life easier and more pleasant at home. Um, thinking about a new subscription, a new family subscription for Spotify, for example, things like that. So, um, you know, beyond the basic needs, if you can cover your basic needs, then there's certain things that you're going to be looking at uh, in your household to make it a more pleasant experience while you're isolated there with your, with your family. Uh, and now it's starting to open up a little bit more. So restaurants and, and you know, some of those sectors are coming back. So I think that there's kind of a trajectory there that I would, I would imagine would play out across most markets. Yeah, right. they, call it, they call it the castle economy. <laughs> so you, you fortalize your, your own castle. You make it as comfortable a place to live because you're not going to be holidaying. Um, and obviously, we're talking about the wealthy segments within Latin America, um, people who would, uh, you know, the wealthy in Latin America are avid travelers, um, they like to get out of their cities. Uh, and some of them have moved um, to their second homes, but they're not traveling abroad. And so they are making life more comfortable for themselves at home. Um, and that might include renovations as well as creature comforts, bigger, bigger screen TV, um, better electronics. Um, a lot of people upgraded their Wi-Fi any way they could over the last year in Latin America. So um, it, it, that's, that's a lot of it. Um, there is a lot of pent up demand for travel, but people are still very apprehensive about going abroad. There's incredible uh, misinformation about uh, what life is like beyond my own country. And, and that's not a Latin American thing. That's around the world, I would say. I, I, I say that because I've traveled now 13 times, cross-border 13 times since the start of the pandemic. And people are shocked that I would take such a reckless you know, risk uh, of getting on an airplane uh, where everyone has uh, got a negative test before they got on the plane and they circulate the air every six seconds. Um, and yet somehow it's a reckless activity. It's more dangerous to go to your supermarket than it is to get on an airplane. But, um, but people don't know that because, um, you know, there's a lot of people assume and, they, and let's face it, the, 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 this thing went global because of air travel. And so air travel is synonymous with the dangers of COVID, but in fact, it's not, but that's going to be a, a, a myth. that's going to take a long time to unwind. All right. Well, we have a question here that talks about sort of the pendulum shifting between the online world and the offline world, because obviously here we've seen online go up. Uh, so uh, what this um, attendee is asking is, 
given the falling income levels in the aggregate and people being pushed into poverty, what are your thoughts on people going back to mom and pop stores, sort of the informal retail and also to brick and mortar retail? I mean, uh, will there be attrition from online back to on uh, to offline once things become normalized? Certainly for um, day to day groceries, um, I think that this is, although people have taken to buying groceries online, um, there's limitations in terms of the people who pick the food, getting the food exactly the way you like it, et cetera. What we generally see, and I don't know if we picked it up in the survey, but what I've heard generally is the wealthier tend to continue to online shop for groceries, whereas uh, the middle classes and working classes tend to go back to traditional. Why? Because online grocery shopping is more expensive. Um, and so going back to markets and informal, but also to large supermarkets um, is generally a more price competitive way to buy your food. And therefore people gravitate for that reason, mostly more than anything. All right. So we have a question here from Diana that's also related to e-commerce. To what degree do you believe that e-commerce growth will be impacted by a reduction in disposable income in consumers across LATAM? And will that disposable income contraction drive certain products like lending for online purchases? Well, there's a lot of questions in that one <laughs> yeah, question. But um, yeah, all, generally consumption power is down. But again, it's, it's down in total numbers, but what's more striking is in the bottom 70% of the population is down a lot. In the next 20% of the population is about the same. And in the top 10% of percentage, you know, it's actually gone up. So um, this is the bigger story, I think. Um, E-commerce has grown, not because people have more money, but because the share of, of purchase versus conventional, you know, dramatically shifted. And I think e-commerce will continue to grow, but it won't grow at the, quite the same pace. Um, so if it, you know, if it grew on, or rather domestic online product e-commerce, the stuff that's physical product delivered to your door, grew in some markets 60 to 70% this year in Latin America. It won't continue to grow at that level going forward. It'll continue to grow, but not at that level because the day-to-day -day stuff will migrate back or some of it will migrate back to brick and mortar. The online lending was already growing. Um, the problem, online lending should be bigger than it is in Latin America. There's a few constraining factors. And one of them is the lack of data, of cr good credit data uh, of, of consumers. Now, Credit bureaus in Latin America have grown a lot over the last 10 years, but they still only track, I would say, realistically, 20 to 25 percent of consumers. These are people who are already online pre-COVID. So these new people who have come online, uh, lenders are not comfortable yet with who they are. They don't have credit history. They're not even using credit cards to buy online. They're using debit cards or virtual cards that are debit nature, prepaid in nature. So to migrate those people to uh, receiving online credit is going to take time still because there's no credit history there. And if there's no credit history, nobody's going to step up to the plate and lend the money. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and I think uh, that dovetails with some of our research, too, on the payment side that we've seen that the, the CAGR, the growth for debit cards in Latin America over the next few years for e-commerce, is, is it looks like it's going to sort of take over the wallet in that sense, just because it's a much more convenient way of payment. And obviously, the credit cards are out of reach for a lot of people. So, yeah, it's not credit cards are not available to more than 70 percent of the population because yeah. those people are not bankable. That's, yeah, that's, that's a, a significant institutional problem. Yeah. Well, we have another question here that's actually related more towards the results from Gianluigi. Uh, so he is asking here, don't you think that the surge of the gray area over the last three months was determined by the massive second wave of the pandemic rather than by a new mindset? And I, I guess he's referring to, to that, the, the, the graphs there with the larger gray area that was not applicable. I think that's sort of my guess, but I'm not sure. I, um... I think he's referring to the attitudinal segments. Okay. Uh, and so the, the gray uh, attitudinal segment where the folks that were scared or irritated, um, 
and certainly the second wave played a part in that and, and certainly um, people's frustrations with the way the governments have handled the pandemic have grown. We've seen that in, in, in Brazil and of course, most recently and very graphically in Colombia. Um, but it's still, it's still uh, John and Anna and I were talking about it just before the webinar started about how, how positive and resolute the populations have remained in these countries. And I suppose that's part of human nature. You know, we're, we're all scared, but we all have to go through it. So we're going to be re resolute. And one of the words that keeps popping up in our interviews around the region that Anna and I are conducting is resilient. You know, people feel like they've been forced to suck it up, so to speak, and become much more resilient in the face of this. So um, if, if we have more surges or waves of COVID or we have some kind of collapse in the vaccination process in the region, you're certainly going to see upticks and, and irritation and, uh, and people feeling scared about the situation. You know, for, for a lot of wealthy countries, this is a once in a century event. And, um, and from an epidemiological point of view, it's also unique in Latin America. But in the last 30 years, this is the sixth major economic um, crisis. Uh, Latin Americans are used to it. Maybe not young Latin Americans, but certainly Latin Americans, older Latin Americans are used to it. They know to save money in the good times and they can really reduce um, their spending in the bad times. And uh, it, it always is always, a, you know, being a source of admiration for me to see how people spring back and remain optimistic. Um, this, what's happening in Latin America today would, would bring other societies to their knees, but Latin Americans, because they've been through it so many times economically, um, do bounce back. And um, I think that this is the tricky part, you know, do you pander to their fear and their frustration and their anger, or do you pander to their optimism and their ability to rebound? And this is a real conundrum for a lot of marketers in terms of finding the right message, the right tone um, around an event, around a service, around a product that you're trying to position in the marketplace. This is why you've really, you've got to go, try to find what these segments, these niches and, and, and differentiate your, your messages accordingly. Yeah, it's definitely a significant challenge in terms of messaging too. So you do not uh, alienate people mistakenly and, and being able to read the room is, is really important. So this kind of research, I think is, is very crucial to marketers for them to sort of get a sense of how to proceed just from a targeting standpoint and how to set up your, your copy from a messaging standpoint, that positioning is crucial. Um, now, I wanted, sorry, yes. I just wanted to answer, I, I don't think I properly answered Boris's question. And he was basically saying, look, what's going to happen to mom and pops versus large retailers. So there's three major in terms of the food or, or common purchase area, there's three major classes of, or four major classes of, of, of retail environment in Latin America. You've got your illegal informal markets uh, in Mexico. They call them tianguis, uh, which these are street markets. Um, um, and these are incredibly adaptable uh, people. They're independent people, um, resellers. Uh, some of them will have gone out of business. Others will still be there. Um, then there's the small mom and pops. Um, and uh, these people have tend to have, it's interesting because we did surveys work with on them years ago. On average, um, they're owner operator. So they have no employees or very few employees. They are very bankable. They've been in business for at least five years. They have almost no debt. Um, so they can shut their doors and, um, and come back, uh, you know, a year later. Um, they, they, we will see some of them disappear for sure, but fewer than you think. Then you have the independent large retailers. This has been a dying breed over the last 10 years as the big mega chains just sort of eat away at them. Those people are the greatest at risk because they probably do carry a lot of debt, uh, certainly a lot of working capital, to keep all their inventory, and they would be in big trouble. And then there's the big guys, the Walmarts, the uh, the Carrefours. Um, um, certainly, you know, uh, 
some of them pulled out of Argentina altogether last year. Um, they tend to make decisions in grand scale. They don't sort of close one shop here or there. Um, so they have remained largely open. They shut down in some places for a few weeks, but they've remained largely open. They've been able to keep their traffic going. So I would say they've done fairly well. But so I, I see those independent, larger retailers in big trouble. Um, and I see the mom and pops in some trouble, but less than you would think. They will still be around as a distribution channel uh, next year. All right. Well, I think we've run over about 10 minutes, uh, sort of our projected time. So I think it's probably best for us to wrap up now. We pretty much have addressed all the relevant questions that we could. So we want to thank you very much for taking the time to join us here today. The materials from this study, uh, this study are going to be sent to you within 24 to 72 hours. We'll be sending out the link to the video of this webinar, as well as the PowerPoint materials that we've set up today. So hopefully some of this data will be helpful to you in terms of making decisions uh, and determining how you're going to approach this market in the future. Thanks so much for spending time with us and we hope that you have a wonderful day.